Are you interested in the world of big data technologies, but find it a little cryptic and see the whole thing as a big puzzle? Are you looking to understand how big data impacts large and small business and people like you and me? This course builds a fundamental understanding of big data problems and Hadoop as a solution. This course takes you through understanding of big data problems with easy to understand examples, history and advent of Hadoop right from when Hadoop wasn't even named Hadoop, what is Hadoop magic which makes it so unique and powerful, understanding the difference between data science and data engineering which is one of the biggest confusions in selecting a career or understanding a job role. And most importantly, demystifying Hadoop vendors like Cloudera, Mapa, and Hortonworks by understanding about them. Hi, I'm Nitesh, your instructor for this course. This course has fundamental essential knowledge one should have if stepping in the world of big data. So unlock the world of big data. See you at the course. Hi, welcome to the lesson Understanding Big Data. And it would be done not in the usual way. In this lesson, we are not going to create the hype about big data, but actually going to understand it. Let's first start with what I mean by hype. You'd have found most of the blogs and videos on internet state the following facts when introduced to big data. Facebook, Twitter, Google generating petabytes of data every day. The Hardened Collider project. There were some people believed that this project could potentially create a black hole on earth and thus destroy the whole world. Although they were proven wrong, but this experiment created so much enormous amount of data that the scientists are discarding large amount of data as they won't be able to analyze and look through all the data that has been generated. They are just hoping that they haven't thrown anything valuable. Now this is something really odd if you do an experiment that puts the whole humanity at stake. All these facts are interesting and true, but they fail to capture the underlying essence of big data on what it is and why it is important to smaller business who are not dealing with huge amount of data as companies as Facebook and Google. So let's understand this in a different way with a very basic example. Let's say that there is a bank. Now let's take a very classic example where an organization is trying to find an optimal price of a new product so as to maximize their profit. Let's say in this case, it may be any travel insurance product. What typically organizations in 90s depended upon was that they would contact a survey firm to gather some feedbacks from a small sample crowds and then there would be a few industry experts who would debate in boardrooms and find the optimal price of the new product. The problem here is that the input from the survey companies and experience of industry experts was a small knowledge base to derive the optimal price with accuracy. This accuracy was a little improved with the advent of data warehousing technologies. Now the organization realized that there is a lot of data around it which could help it to find the optimal price. For example, it had the mainframe databases which would typically have lots of customer and their activity related information. Then there was their website where they could look at and find out what are the products people are showing interest in using the web logs. And then they had the transaction logs of customers which would give a peek in spending patterns of their customers. Then they could look outside the organization at the competitor's pricing as well. Survey from the market trends and the third party statistics of how accidents are happening and what is the probability of claim happening in an area. With data warehousing, what an organization does is that it takes out the most relevant and small pieces of data from each of these sources and stacks them together on a one big expensive server and run smartly written complex algorithms to find the optimal price. 
This is a basic idea of data warehousing tool, which is the current industry standard for the decision support system. Please note that the data is the underlying foundation of decisions. Data when processed finds its meaning as decision support system. The data warehouse gave a pretty accurate insight to the data and was of great help in providing a stable decision support system. But it had some shortcomings. The major disadvantage with data warehouse was that the algorithm ran on a small sample of data collected from different sources. If the data sample increased, the server would take very long time to compute all the data and derive meaningful results out of it. So in a few business scenarios, it was like looking at the room through a keyhole and finding the size and shape of the room. Second shortcoming was the process of collecting the data from various sources and cleaning and organizing them and then running heavy analytics on them took a lot of turnaround time which made the results go stale. It was like deciding to cross the road based on a picture that was taken 5 minutes ago. So basically, it was a lack of capability to process lots of data and the ability to do it quickly which started to cause the problem. This lots of data is known as big data and the tools with which we can process and analyze big data are known as big data tools. Hadoop is one of the big data tool. With Hadoop, you can sample much larger amount of data at a much quicker throughput and at a much lower price than the existing data warehousing tools. So that's a very simple take on understanding the big data and Hadoop. Now let's look at the textbook definition and see if this all makes sense. The definition says, big data are a collection of data sets so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using on-hand database management tools or traditional data processing applications. Let's see it in parts and make sure that we understand it completely. Big data are a collection of data sets. As we saw in the previous example, the organizations are collecting data from a lot of data sources. The data sets are large and complex. Of course so, an organization would ideally like to consider as much as data possible so as to derive to the most accurate results. And that is why it became difficult for the database management tools and traditional processing application to process it as the volume of the data sites increased. We would see and learn about this later in this course as to why the single server architecture started to fail. This example also brings out three V attributes that are used to describe the big data problems. Volume, Variety and Velocity. Volume reflects the large amount of data that needs to be processed. As the various data sets are stacked together, the amount of data increases. Variety reflects different sources of data. It can vary from web server logs to structured data from databases to unstructured data from social media. And the third V, velocity, reflects the amount of data which keeps on accumulating with time. Although these three Vs are a very good description of big data problems and may help you to find it in your organization. But again, these are just the guidelines to describe big data problems. There can be big data problem scenarios where only two Vs are applicable or even a single V is applicable. Can you think of those scenarios? Hello and welcome to a new lesson. In this lesson, we would sneak and peek into the future of data and its importance to society and business. In the previous lesson, we saw how the data is functioning as decision support system. Soon, its role is going to graduate as a fundamental basis of digital nervous system. 
The term digital nervous system was popularized by Bill Gates in his book Business at the Speed of Thought, which released in 1999. It wasn't a term coined by him, but certainly he popularized this idea the most. What it refers to is that organization would start to act as biological nervous system. If we simplify biological nervous system, it follows the following cycle. It senses, interprets, decides and acts. It senses information from five sense organs, then interprets sensation and refers to historical data and then it decides what actions would be favorable to the situation and then it acts on the decision. Similarly, this behavior can be replicated in an organization with data acting as a foundation of such a digital nervous system. This would sound more like Skynet or a nervous system in Avatar in the forest. So if you find it good, you can think it like an Avatar forest. But if you belong to the school of thought that machines can overtake one day, think it as a Skynet. Let's return to our example and see with a small example how things would happen with a hypothetical case scenario. Let's suppose a case. If suppose you update on social media that you are going on an international travel and the bank's core software gets this feed from social media updates and then sends you a message on your cell about a cool international travel insurance which suits you. Or there can be another simpler case that the competitors change the price of their product and the bank's core software quickly responds to the situation and changes the price of its product to maximize the profit. This is what the future of organization is and you'll see the trend of this happening very soon. But actually, it is not the future anymore. This phenomena is already happening right now. Can you think of these scenarios happening around you? Pause the video right now and give a think on where you are seeing this phenomena happening right now. Okay, I hope that you have given it a thought. I'll show you my Facebook page. Here are a few adverts. There are some things which would be related because I might have searched something before. Now I would go to Google and search for a refrigerator. After a while, I start to get advertisement about the refrigerator on my Facebook AdWords. At a lot of places in Google Ads as well, this thing would creep up. Facebook and Google are using this software intelligence already and you can see this thing happening. There is no human intervention which decides if this ad should go there. Classification of audience and display of ads and charges to the advertiser happens all through the software without any human intervention. And this is just one example. Google page ranking, suggestions, recommendations on YouTube and so many places. It is the software which is sensing you, interpreting you, deciding and acting upon you. These kind of customized services, every bank and small business organization is also striving for. And this is possible only by processing huge amounts of data. And that is why you see that the big data jobs would continue to increase with time in near future. So again, I'll put up some stats which you'll find everywhere you look to get introduced to big data. But what I hope is that you clearly see that this is the future and it would involve a lot of software development and skills and resources which are clearly very less right now. Why has it suddenly crept up and we see a sudden shortage? We would learn about it in the next lesson.
Welcome to a new lesson. Till now, we have looked into data and its importance. We also know that it is growing big and its possibilities in coming future. In this lesson, we would look at what triggered big data technologies and see how things unfolded from the time when Hadoop wasn't even Hadoop. It started all around the year 1998 when the internet created a new boom and search engines were looking at huge amounts of data to process. They were the first to get hit by an enormous large amount of data to be processed. They were looking to categorize all the web pages of the World Wide Web. If you remember, the web was a chaotic place then. There was just text index of links and it went from one category to another subcategory and finding something meaningful and relevant was very difficult. It was just 10-15 years ago and now we have Google, which brings out the best results in milliseconds or less. So back then, Yahoo was a leader when the search engine boom started. It was around that time itself, industry had realized that they need cluster of computers to process the big amount of data, as the data to be processed was too much for the capacity of a single powerful server. Moreover, the data was constantly increasing and changing. At that point, Yahoo started to face big data problems as they were looking at the data from the complete worldwide web. They even after a while made their own versions of distributed computing. Then of course Google came into picture and showed the world how they achieved the most accurate results by deploying crawlers and page ranking algorithms. They were one of the very first to make a distributed computing framework which solved their search engine problems with accuracy. Around that time, Doug Cutting and his colleague Mike were already working on a project Nutch, which was as well a search engine, which was deployed on distributed clusters. You see, at the start of this century, most projects in Silicon Valley were related to search engines, and that was the main big idea or the pain point in IT that time. Of course, Google's design was the most superior and the most accurate one. Then in 2003, Google Labs published paper Google file system and then in the following year, December, Google Labs published the paper on MapReduce which explained the, the underlying distributed framework they used. These were only high level designs on how they manage clusters and not the low level designs. At this point of time, Doug and Mike saw these papers and found them really interesting. They made improvement to their project Nutch to make Nutch distributed file system in 2004 and changed to MapReduce framework by 2005. Doug saw this as a possibility to create a framework which can solve a lot many problems rather than just web searches. Around the end of 2005 and start of 2006, this project moved out and was named Hadoop with an idea that it would create a framework which would be generically be applicable in various big data problems and not just the search engines. So Hadoop was nudged before it actually became Hadoop and got its own identity. The story of the project getting the name Hadoop goes like this. Long back, when Doug's three-year-old son was playing with his yellow elephant toy, he named it Hadoop. Doug found that the name was interesting and with no meanings attached. He noted that name long back and when this project sprung up, he named it Hadoop. He tells that his son, now a teenager, is very proud of his feet and wants his share of copyrights as well. Till 2005 and 6, Yahoo was as well having distributed clusters and their own distributed computing framework, Dreadnought, which was struggling when the number of nodes on the cluster increased. They appointed Doug with a dedicated team to run their services which were web scale and decided to adopt Hadoop framework around 2005. In August 2010, Doug has moved to Cloudera. Towards the end of 2013, Apache released a stable version of Hadoop 2 which is also known as YARN which is a short form of yet another resource negotiator also known as next generation Hadoop. All Hadoop versions were launched as open source, 
and were monitored by Apache, which works extensively on open source projects. Just like to add that Apache is a volunteer run organization and launches all the open source projects, Hadoop being one of them. It was in 2005 and 6, Hadoop initial versions were launched, but only in 2013, when Hadoop 2 was launched, Hadoop 1 was named. Before that, they were just 0.86 releases. The design changes in Hadoop 2, also known as YARN, makes Hadoop more closer to the original Google's MapReduce paper. So as if now in 2014, Google is ahead in terms of technical design of a distributed framework than the rest of the world as they were the first to start it and the rest of the world has been following them till this point. They had just released the papers in 2004 and 5, which talks about their design on a high level, but of course they never released the low level designs. Doug and Mike are the people who were the first to see and implement the framework of distributed computing, which could be used for a lot more than just web searches, that is crawling and indexing. Yahoo is one of the largest company to have Hadoop cluster and which makes open source contributions to Hadoop. So does Facebook and Twitter. Yahoo contributed a lot to Hadoop, Pig being one of the major contribution. Likewise, Facebook contributed Hive, Twitter contributed Storm. The business advantage these companies seek by making open source contributions is that it becomes easier for them to find trained resources in that technology if it is out there in the market or else it would be very difficult for them if they keep the tools in-house. On top of it, they get branding benefits and they contribute to the society as well. So as you see here, that it was Google's research paper and Doug's and Mike's effort to realize the potential of framework for many other situations, which led to the birth of Hadoop and the big data problems in IT were first handled by search engines. In the next lesson, let us see in general what is the change in software architecture Hadoop framework brings, which makes it so unique and so powerful. Welcome to a new lesson. In this lesson, we would talk a little about what happens inside Hadoop and how it has solved the problem of big data so differently. Grace Murray Hopper, the famous American computer scientist, gave a real good example to understand the distributed computing paradigm. She explained, historically, ox were used to carry the load. Then when the load increased, we didn't consider to grow the ox large, but instead, we used several ox put together to pull the heavy load. This same idea is applied while analyzing big data and when this concept is applied to computing world, it is termed as distributed computing. Till this point, as the data has increased, we have tried to increase the computation power and it has worked well for us. But now we have enormous amount of data and it is constantly increasing. So now distributed frameworks which use a cluster of computers are going to be the solutions for such scenarios where the data to be processed is very large. Having a cluster of computers to process the large data has twofold price advantage. Custom hardwares with higher configurations are super expensive. Then B, the license fee of traditional RDBMS is expensive, while Hadoop is free and open source. Hadoop is one of the framework which helps applications to be developed on the distributed computing concepts. When we talk about Hadoop, then there are two major components which sets up the core of Hadoop. It's the file system which is also known as Hadoop Distributed File System or HDFS and then there is programming framework on top of it which works in tandem with HDFS which is known as MapReduce Framework. So in many ways, you can think Hadoop provides a layer between the user and the cluster of machines under it. And it has many features like an operating system would have, which manages multiple nodes under it. 
So as a user, you need not worry about the multiple storage and computation resources. They would be handled by Hadoop and would be abstracted from the user's point of view. HDFS or Hadoop Distributed File System is inspired from Google File System and Hadoop MapReduce Framework is inspired from Google MapReduce Paper. Both MapReduce and HDFS work on a cluster of systems. Both of them have hierarchical architecture. That is, there is a master-slave model. So in a broader view, what happens is that a large file is broken into smaller portions of the file, which is known as blocks, then it is replicated and is distributed over the cluster of computers. This distribution is managed by Hadoop itself and user need not worry about the division and distribution of file. Like an operating system, Hadoop manages the file system. Internally what happens is that there is one master node known as name node which looks over that the data is distributed amongst the data node and keeps track of the distribution of the blocks. So basically name node manages the file system and the data node actually stores the data blocks. Both name node and data node are Hadoop daemons, actually Java programs that run on specific machines. So do not think them as hardware components, but the machines that run Hadoop daemon name node need to be more powerful than the machines which run data nodes. And hence there is a difference in specifications and configurations of the machines. And so the physical machines are usually referred to as name node and data nodes, but actually they are just the Java programs. My other course, Hadoop certification made easy explains the details of HDFS in depth. And just in case, if you're more curious to learn, please go through that course once. Then in MapReduce framework, what happens is that the problem is divided into two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. In the map phase, the mapper code is distributed amongst the machines and they work on the data which is locally present on that machine. This concept is technically termed as data locality. The results produced from the computation of the data, which has been computed locally, is aggregated and transferred to the reducer. Then reduce algorithms are applied to this global data to produce the final result. Programmers need to write only the map logic and the reduce logic. The correct distribution of map code to the correct machines is all handled by Hadoop. Again, this is a very superficial overview of how a job is done. There are various complexities involved in designing the solution as now there are two phases in which solution needs to be divided. My course Hadoop certification made easy talks about solution designing in a little more depth. So the basic idea is that the job is broken in between a cluster of computers and in order to process in distributed fashion, algorithm needs to be broken into two phases known as map phase and the reduce phase which is basically very different from the approach we have seen till now. Till now, when the computation is getting done on a single machine, we have single algorithm which process the data. But in distributed framework as Hadoop, generally solutions would have two components, the map phase where the data is treated locally and the reduce phase where the data is processed on global aggregate of the output of the map phase. So Hadoop has brought these three fundamental changes, which are disruptive or absolutely against the classical approaches to handle and manage data. We know till date. Firstly, the code moves to the data rather than data moving to the code. Till now, it was the other way around, but when the data goes huge, it is much more efficient to move the code to the data rather than data to the code. Second, use of commodity hardware rather than custom and highly expensive hardware. To have a big high computation server, it may cost something around 50K and then you'll have to buy the software licenses as well. Hadoop being open source, it is cheaper. Even forming a cluster is far more cheaper than buying one super expensive server. Studies have shown that Hadoop cluster can give 10 times the throughput at one tenth of the cost in certain situations. Third and lastly, read on schema. The schema of the data can be decided on the time of read rather than at the time of store. This is a big change to the fundamental of classical database management we have seen till now.
So these are the three big blows Hadoop has brought, which were the fundamental concepts before Hadoop came into picture. In the next lesson, we'll discuss a little about Hadoop ecosystem. Welcome to a new lesson, Hadoop Ecosystems. Here in this lesson, we would learn about what is meant by Hadoop Ecosystem. HDFS and MapReduce are the core framework of Hadoop on which big data is stored and processed in distributed fashion. Hadoop Ecosystem refers to a set of tools which help in storage and processing of the big data. And the members of Hadoop Ecosystems are always increasing. What is happening is that all the tools which are based on distributed technologies are getting integrated with Hadoop framework with time. As then, its possible use cases increase a lot. So let's start out with PIG. It is a tool which uses scripting statements to process the data. Typically, it would take enormous amount of time and efforts to write a complex jobs in language like Java or Python etc. PIG is relatively simple data flow language which cuts down on development time and efforts. Typically it was designed for data scientists who have less programming skills. Hive provides SQL-like language tool which runs on top of MapReduce. PIG and Hive were developed at different places that is PIG at Yahoo and Hive at Facebook with the same idea in mind. They both were developed to aid data scientists with poor programming skills to process the data. So if you observe that both PIG and Hive are above MapReduce layer. The code written in PIG or Hive gets converted into MapReduce jobs and then run on HDFS. Then in order to facilitate the movement of data into or out of Hadoop, Scoop and Flume are used. Scoop helps in moving the data from a relational database and Flume is used to ingest the data as it is created by an external source. Then there is tools like Impala which is used for low latency queries. HBase is another tool which provides features like a real-time database to retrieve the data from HDFS. And then there are more tools as well. For a complete understanding of tools and an idea of how software architecture of a company would be, please look at my course Hadoop Architecture for Enterprises, where explanation of the roles of Hadoop ecosystems like Uzi, Mahout, Strom, Chikawa, Kafka is given and basic idea behind the software architecture of an organization is explained. The biggest problem with so many tools is that these tools were developed independently and parallelly by different organizations. For example, when Yahoo came up with Pig, Facebook came up with Hive and they made the tools open source for everyone to use it. So what has happened is that there is a lot of compatibility issues between the Hadoop ecosystem components. This is where Cloudera, Hortonworks come into picture and they score points. They also package all the open source components and add their flavor and release their own versions of packages. So their packages have all the ecosystem components which are compatible. The business model is to basically keep software products open source and free of charge, but charge for their services. In the next lesson, we would see a few interesting topics of discussions which have been between the students taking courses from HadoopSkills.com. Welcome to a new lesson. There have been a few interesting topics of discussions amongst the Hadoop learners from HadoopSkills.com. The discussions are a very valuable contributions to the lessons as they bring about different ideas 
about the things that have been learned. Here are a few topics which all are contributions of the Hadoop learners from the course HadoopSkills.com. It works like a community where all the learners ask questions, answer, connect and network. So one of the interesting discussion topics was why a simple algorithm on a large data set would work better than a complicated algorithm on a small data set. One of the core ideas with big data and Hadoop solutions is that it gives ability to process a large amount of data. Studies have shown that simple algorithms over a large data set yield better results than the complex algorithms on a smaller data sets. What it means to have a complex algorithm is that algorithm has to be sensitive towards the weak correlations and should be able to account for them in calculating the final results. In order to have this sensitivity, it gets really complicated to properly weigh and assess the correlation as the data is relatively small to work with. So the algorithms get complex when there is small data to work with. However, with the larger data sets, this problem is not there. The relations between the data points would be far more accurate when the sample amount of data is huge. The algorithms can be simpler in nature and thus would be easier to code as well. On the other hand, complex algorithms are a little complicated to code and design and data scientists would have to design complex data models considering various scenarios. That brings us to the next interesting comparison of roles of data scientists and the data engineers. Somehow this is a common thing which many people get confused with. So in the ideal world, data scientists are generally the people who understand the various statistical models and can find out ways how a problem can be solved using the data around. On the other hand, data engineers are the people who implement the ideas of the data scientist to create the technical architecture, which would be a technical implementation of the solution. So now it would be clear that skills that are required for data scientists would be a good mathematical knowledge and a greater understanding about statistical models and with a little skills of programming as well. On the other hand, skills expected from a data engineer would be a strong technical knowledge and programming skills and ability to formulate technical solutions. A little statistical knowledge would come in handy. Although in the real world, there is a lot of overlap between the two roles. But what is to be understood is that you do not grow from data engineer to a data scientist or data scientists are more important. Data scientists and data engineers have different roles and responsibilities and skill sets. So learning Hadoop doesn't mean that you'll become a data scientist, but having a good exposure to other mathematical skills and knowledge would be a bigger strength in order to become a data scientist. So when choosing career or hiring someone for these roles, please choose wisely and understand that they are two different roles and responsibilities. The last and quite an important discussion is that what is the difference between the different vendors uh, like Apache Hadoop, Cloudera, Mapar and Hortonworks. It is quite complicated to see that there are so many vendors, but if you understand their business a little more, you develop a automatic understanding towards these vendors. So starting out with Apache, Apache Software Foundation is known to develop and contribute open source projects. It's a volunteer run organization. From Hadoop's point of view, Apache Hadoop is the most fundamental Hadoop installation. You'll have to install the other tools from Hadoop ecosystem supporting the Hadoop technologies along with this installation. Typically, any solution would require a lot of components of Hadoop ecosystem rather than just MapReduce and HDFS. So that is why other vendors come into play. Cloudera is another vendor which is one of the oldest vendors of Hadoop distribution and with the biggest market capture when I make this video. It scores over Apache as you need not install every component of Hadoop ecosystem separately as the installation package has almost all the important ones covered. 
the software package is completely based out on Apache Hadoop and is a freeware. However, they have a few proprietary tools like Enterprise Manager, which are not for free, but they contribute to the open source market as well. Then MAPA. MAPAR is a vendor which develops and sells Apache Hadoop derived softwares. So what it means is that they do not use Apache Hadoop as their core platform, but they have their own proprietary version of that. Their HDFS and MapReduce framework is written in C, which is unlike Apache Hadoop, which is written in Java. However, they support APIs used for Apache Hadoop. They claim their distribution to provide full data protection, no single point of failure, and dramatic ease of use. MapR is selected by Amazon to provide an upgraded version of Amazon's Elastic MapReduce services. It has also been selected by Google as its technology partner. Then Hortonworks is the latest entry in the Hadoop vendors. It is a division that has spawned out from Yahoo and uses Apache Hadoop as its core platform for its distribution. That means it is also another flavor of Apache Hadoop. In October 2011, Hortonworks announced that it would collaborate with Microsoft for Hadoop distributions. So they are working on integration of .NET framework with Hadoop as well. Then now there is a the news that the hardware giants Intel and EMC are going to launch their own versions of Hadoop. It clearly signifies that in future, most of the hardware would be used in Hadoop clusters and these hardware giants understand this wave and they are making strategic change to handle the future market changes. Intel very recently rolled back on the plan to release their own version of Hadoop and instead has associated itself with Cloudera. So as I make this video, there are these three startups and one industry biggie who are looking to provide Hadoop distribution and there is a lot of interesting things in store for the future on how these companies battle it out to maximize their market capture. Hope you would have learned something interesting and of value in this course. Please make sure to check out hadoopskills.com for more high quality courses which can expedite your learning. I would attach a document with this lesson with a few important links. Please like us on the Facebook page and you just might be able to get some discount coupons on our paid courses. Moreover, you'd be able to know as soon as we launch any other course. Wish you a happy learning and all the success in your endeavors.